Well, hi, I'm Marty Graff. Uh, I do spoken word with matching art, and I hope you enjoy it. Each of us sees through a different lens. The same artwork can be a masterpiece or mud, depending on the museum goer. A referee's call is often disputed by the other team. Where 17th century military engineers envisioned coiled metal as a way to dislodge bullets, vintners saw a corkscrew. Such disparate applications war, winemaking, seven billion points of view, and growing. The face zone is my point of view, a creative space where I reflect on inner and outer worlds, a place where I imagine, draw, and write about it. The resulting pieces could be flashes from fantastical narratives for which you must construct the plot. They could be metaphors could be puzzles, jokes, commentaries, commands, questions, visions. What connects them is that they all begin with some kind of captioned face to prompt reaction and thought. As much as the material is a window into my worldview, it's also a mirror reflecting yours as your particular combination of experiences, values, and beliefs influences the meaning that you take away. Though some of our associations may overlap, they don't have to. The point is to set mind in motion. Toward what end to what end is for you to decide. But enjoy the sights along the way. Surreal daydreams to trip your imagination. February 2004, Hong Kong. I was hiking Lantau Island when the trail unexpectedly brought me to a beach. No other people, not a footprint, no boats on the water, nor any other man-made structures in sight. The Pacific like a still, breezeless lake under the overcast sky, a scene of sublime inactivity. Seeing now that this was my destination, I took off my backpack, used a rock to dig a butt-sized hollow in the sand, <laughs> planted mine in there, and reclined against the pack. For an hour, I didn't move. Just my eyes panning the ocean, reading the horizon like the most important poem ever written. Well, there was only one return bus to town, not much time. So I sat up, brushed off, and continued along eons sooner than I wanted. I've been back many times in my imagination, though. That boundless refuge where no distance is too far, our passport is always valid, and touchdown is just a thought away. During the hard times especially, our mind's eye sees us through. When the windows of the world let in the harsh light, workplace anguish, imploded love, a fatal diagnosis, we can pull down our eyelid shades and take respite in whatever setting we conjure. For me, it's that incidental shore at low K1. For you? We can't ignore reality either. The longer you spend inside, the more force the outside world amasses against you. Bills pile. Disappointment turns to depression. The tumor doubles in size. You've got to take care of life before it takes care of you. In doing so, you enable the next beautiful moment to retreat to when ugliness returns. Damn. 
Why is it downright effortless to be negative? <laughs> Easy as flopping onto a sagging old couch. At times, I have to consciously will myself to maintain an optimistic outlook, like holding a mental plank position, whereas pessimism comes as freely as diarrhea. <laughs> the wrong notes seem to ring loudest. A persistent pebble in a hiking boot spoils the majestic rockiness of the mountain. In truth, things usually work out, and a statistically significant number of people perform inspiring acts. So this default gloominess perplexes me. Undoubtedly, life is a gorgeous light that I mean to burn brilliantly for as long as the filament lasts. Perhaps I should switch to an LED. <laughs> Nonetheless, my brain bends toward darkness. Curvature of the mind. People form strange tribes. No matter how intense or esoteric the interest, there's an established fraternity sorority, or secret society of its aberrant connoisseurs and practitioners. Rocky Horror Picture Show reenactors. <laughs> Plushy fetishists. <laughs> <laughs> Freemasons. Nazis. The Mid-Atlantic Conference of Albino, Born-Again, Vegan Weavers. Each organization has a recorder. Someone whose role is to be present, document, and distribute information to the group. When a club's charter is ethically questionable, or markedly vile, one wonders how its secretary can so passively bear witness. These recruits deserve our contempt and appreciation. They don't try to stop it, but they amass indefensible evidence, making it harder for inhumanity to repeat itself. Those unswatted flies on the walls of history. Substance and style rarely come in equal measure. My mother's sister is as sophisticated as she is fun, as genuine as she is refined uses adjectives like fabulous and smashing without a hint of pretentiousness. There isn't space enough in her bookshelf-lined home to contain all she's read and the couple she's written. But her closet was just as full of dancing shoes back in the day. She loved to dance. One of my early memories is being held, bounced, and whirled around by Aunt Joan as the Beatles come together turned against the needle which would skip when we carried on too forcefully. <laughs> Riding horses made her happier still. Another sort of dancing. Naturally, I've always known the older woman. She was in her 30s by the time I was born. But I also like to imagine her before that, in the 1960s, sipping highballs at a Nina Simone concert, as the anecdote goes. The gravity of the music, the tri-colored stage lights casting a soulful serenity over the room. The way her luminous life force and encouraging love have shined on me. We've come to value attention over the reason for it. Turning heads by any means necessary. But there's only so much meaningful notoriety to go around. And most of us aren't going to come up with a vaccine or win a Grammy. <laughs> so fools rush center stage, bucking and braying for the camera like jackasses. Each resounding hee-haw lowering the standard for recognition as it drowns the signal in dumb, hollow noise. And the country is too busy taking a cinnamon challenge to vote down the forces taking our future. <laughs> to influence this circus, the visionaries will have to get a lot louder and learn to juggle. Chainsaws, 
on a flaming unicycle. One of our most salient human characteristics is our capacity for storytelling. Stories entertain, move, and shape us. They document, explain, and instruct. Some narratives are so powerful, so thoroughly internalized by a population, they have a greater impact than bombs. Certainly, many weapons have been discharged in defense of one coveted tale over another. But as much sway as stories hold over us, they're an arbitrary force we manufacture. Accounts become so old and well-known, we forget they could have followed a different plot line. Imagine if we had access to rough drafts. What if Medusa had a scalp of golden roses and transformed people into pure chi? <laughs> What if Robert Frost had taken the highway? <laughs> How about a female Christ? In an alternate version, we may just as easily have spent a childhood leaving quarters under our pillows for the scab fairy. <laughs> a revised manuscript may well alter the course of an entire culture. Felines are notoriously aloof and elusive souls, which is one reason I adore them so, and why I take great pride in my cat whispering abilities. When I'm somewhere they're likely to be, my first order of business is to make contact, the holy grail being to romance them into getting scooped up and letting me press those warm, underneath pad parts of their feet against my face. <laughs> I switch into my most charming, reassuring cat speak, and they know that I know. <laughs> they come chirping and blinking in approval, weaving vigorous figure eights through my legs with almost involuntary affection. I have the opposite effect on dogs. <laughs> Still, I wondered if my game would be enough to impress the strays of old Gorbio, a medieval seaside town in the mountains of the French Riviera where I visited one summer across the Atlantic, wandering that 12th century village near the clouds. Part of me was expecting different cats. Would these old world French felines be extra snooty, into cheese and smoking? <laughs> or unapproachable feral vagrants, ready with flesh-shredding violence, should I dare to put the moves on? Well, the first encounter along my tour a gray and white tabby who not only let me hold her, but then bouncily pursued me into a rustic church, allayed any doubt. Deeper into the damp, overcast alleyways, a blind orange one with cloudy blue eyes remained remarkably calm as my approaching voice progressed into petting. In the absence of mutual sight, our essences connected. I gather this primal, spiritual communication would be the same with cats in Italy, Australia, Afghanistan, as with the people around this vast rock. Not so far and after all. Our lives are a choreography through the abrasion of time. We maneuver about the stage of existence, each experience adding to our spiritual core while simultaneously eroding its container. Just as a pencil shortens with every expressive stroke, a ballerina grinds herself down a little more to stick the next inspiring landing. A marathoner crosses the finish line with a smaller body and a bigger soul. The same goes for rock climbing, mosh pits, work, love, any act at all. The most significant choice we make each day is how to use ourselves up 
on what to spend our fleeting life force. Fully living means dancing toward death with purpose, passion, and style to stick that ultimate landing. Thanks a lot. <laughs>